committee is having an opportunity to have a bite at you in terms of uh, vetting and assessing your suitability to hold the office to which you have been nominated. Before we start, we'll do some quick introduction of the team or the committee that's going to interrogate you. On my right is the debut speaker of the House, Honorable Gladys Boss. On my left is the clerk of the National Assembly, Samuel Njoroge. I'll now invite all the members to introduce themselves, starting with uh, Naisula here. Go around. Naisula Lesuda, Samburu West MP. Kimani Shango. Junet Mohamed. Nelson Koesh. Kosing David. Kikari David. Emma Mary. Abdul Rahim Daoud. I'm Ferdinand Kevin Wanyonyi. George Gitonga Murugara. Owen Bayer. Robert Mbui. Stephen Mule. Dido Raso. Abdi Shurie. Mishimboko Likoni. Rehab Mukami Washira. I'm Kaleba Misi Saboti. We also have the secretariat that is uh, supporting this process, led by the deputy clerk, Sarah Kyoko, where is she? And all those uh, good people sitting behind, who will be giving us some uh, behind the curtain support. Professor Kindiki, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We'll start by asking you the obvious questions to introduce yourself briefly, stating your name, family background, education background, work and employment experience, your present engagement, and your status of compliance with all the relevant agencies of government that we passed on to you. You have five minutes for this exercise. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and honorable members of this committee. Mr. Speaker, my name is Kithure Kindiki. I am 52 years old. I was born in Tharakanithi and grew up there went to primary school there and upon my completion of secondary education I studied law. I have a Bachelor of Laws degree from my university which I obtained in 1998. I have a Master of Law from the University of Pretoria and I have a PhD in international law from the University of Pretoria, which I obtained in 2002. I am married, I have th three children, and I have worked in the last 25, 26 years in various capacities. Um, I'm an advocate of the High Court of Kenya of 24 years standing. And in the process of my career, Honorable Speaker, I have worked as a lecturer. I taught at Moi University for three years and later on at the University of Nairobi for nine years. I rose from the position of assistant lecturer until I became Associate Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Nairobi. In between, I was Head of Department of Public Law. I have been licensed to practice law in Kenya, but also before international 
courts and tribunals, including the International Criminal Court, where I still remain in the list of defense counsel. Mr. Speaker, sir, I've been consulted for many organizations, including UN agencies, regional organizations like IGAD, Comesa, African Union, East African Community, and also I am a member of a number of professional organizations, including the Academic Council for the United Nations System, the International Association on the Study of Forced Migration, the International Co uh, Commission of Jurists, the East African Law Society, and the Law Society of Kenya. I submit. Thank you. Uh, status of compliance. Mr. Speaker, sir, I have filed to Parliament through the clerk my compliance with the Higher Education Loans Board, my compliance with the Kenya Revenue Authority in terms of uh, tax compliance. I also have uh, filed my compliance with all the other statutory uh, bodies, including ESCC, as well as the clearance from a recognized credit bureau, as uh, was guided. And therefore, I want to submit, Mr. Speaker, that I've complied with all the statutory requirements, as was guided by this House. And you have all the documents? Yes, I do. Uh, you'll pass them on to that sergeant next to you to give to Sarah Kyoko to have a look at? Uh, does that include the certificates? And, and yes, and yes. Okay, all right. She'll uh, compare with the copies that you sent to Parliament. I will now open the session for asking and interrogating the nominee. And I'll give the first shot to the debut speaker. Professor Kendiki, uh, I know this is within your knowledge that the Maraga Task Force on police reforms identified many challenges in the National Police Service, the Kenya Prison Service, and the National Youth Service as underfunding, endemic corruption, poor handling of human capital and development. Uh, so could you highlight for us some of the police reforms that you undertook during your just ended tenure as Cabinet Secretary for Inter Interior Internal uh, National Administration? And, and also, if approved, what are some of the measures that you will put in place to, rec to implement some of those recommendations? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I forgot to say between 2022 and 11th July 2024, I was the Cabinet Secretary for Interior and National Administration. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in, resp in response to the question by the Deputy Speaker, I respond as follows. That the task force that was established to recommend legal policy, institutional, and other reforms in the National Police Service and the Kenya Prison Service made far-reaching recommendations on a number of issues, including welfare issues, leadership and accountability issues, career progression and succession management in the National Police Service, and also operational capabilities equipment and so forth. Mr. Speaker, sir, that task force recommended 221 uh, recommendations that require administrative action. It also recommended a further 178 recommendations which require um, funding 
but do not require any changes in law or policy. The task force recommended another 177 recommendations, which may not require funding, but require legislative and policy changes. And finally, the task force recommended 23 recommendations in connection with the National Police Service, not, not the Kenya Prison Service, 23 of them that require consultations and concurrence with the National Security Council. We have, in the period when I have been the Cabinet Secretary for Interior, we have been able to take action on some of the recommendations that did not require um, uh, legal or policy changes. For example, we've rolled out a massive police equipment modernization program, which will be rolled out in five years. And already under my um, leadership, we were able to convince the government and the national treasury to allocate 7 billion shillings which has already been spent to buy air and land assets to assist officers who have been exposed to great danger those that are helping to keep the country safe in the front line in the fight against terror the fight against banditry and other sophisticated organized crimes and therefore, this equipment is already up and running, especially mine resistance, uh, ambush protected vehicles, armored personnel carriers, personal protection equipment, air, uh, and also aerial um, unmanned vehicles, which are commonly known as drones. And we've been able to restore the police air wing which had collapsed and we have uh, uh, some of the aircrafts which are now operational and helping us with air surveillance and we have also hoping in the in the next financial here if I am if I am approved by this house we'll be able to purchase additional gunship helicopters to help us um, finish the remaining work in terms of the fight against terror, the fight against banditry and other organized crimes. Mr. Speaker, I also need to point out that because of the grave issues around leadership and succession management and career progression in the, in the National Police Service, during my 21 months as the Cabinet Secretary for Interior, we've been able to put in place, operationalize the National Police Leadership Academy, which we opened, His Excellency the President opened in Gong. And this is the academy that is helping us put together a curriculum that will help us put in place short courses, professional courses to retool, reskill, our police officers, especially those that are in leadership, and also provide a fast track process of identifying, nurturing leadership uh, among our police officers. And therefore, going forward with the academy now operational, we believe that in the next few years, we're going to inculcate not only fast um, uh, 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 succession management and career progression um, a program, but also we're going to have a very motivated leadership within our uh, uh, police officers. We have also, of course, uh, uh, taken action around welfare issues. Already the f uh, increments for the the first, um, the first uh, increments that were proposed by the task force have already been uh, put in place. We have also, in terms of giving motivation to our officers, uh, also operationalized the National Police Service uh, uh, Hospital, which is uh, 
they're supposed to take care of uh, those who are injured in the front line so that they are not exposed to um, 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 health or even subsequent risks when they visit uh, ordinary hospitals. So by and large, that's what we've done. And finally, on the proposals that require legislative reforms and policy reforms, we have formulated about six pieces of legislation which are ready. They are just waiting for stakeholder participation and then they'll be conveyed to parliament through cabinet. And if I can highlight this as I end that um, the response, Mr. Speaker, they include uh, number one, the National Police Service Amendment Bill 2024, the National Police Service Commission uh, Amendment Bill 2024, the National um, uh, Forensic Laboratory um, a Bill, a Services Bill 2024. We have also uh, formulated um, the a, a bill which will also assist us in the leadership and the command um, uh, oversight in the National uh, Police Service. I submit. Thank you, Majority Leader. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Um, my question to the CS nominee relates uh, to just where he stopped on the legal and uh, legislative proposals that he was considering before his exit from the ministry, and uh, more so around the issue of uh, implementation of Article 37 of the Constitution on the right of Kenyans to picket, assemble, demonstrate peaceably. And CS, you have seen in the recent past um, a lot of confrontations between members of the public and the police. And it's my view that principally why this has been so is because you have failed to designate picketing corners. And Kenyans uh, imagine you can picket anywhere and everywhere, uh, including in uh, some areas that you consider restricted areas. I would want to hear what is it that you would intend to do if you are reappointed and approved by this committee to ensure that there are no more confrontations between members of the public who want to peaceably uh, assemble and picket and the police. Two, there seems to have been a complete breakdown in administrative and security structures in the country. And I say that in view of uh, when you came into office, uh, the Shakahola massacre, where up to now we don't know how many Kenyans lost their lives in Shakahola. We have seen in the recent past Kware uh, here in Nairobi. In a country like ours, how is it possible where you have chiefs, assistant chiefs, Nyumba Kumi, and all the uh, structures and uh, security and administrative structures that we have, that 20, 40 people can be killed around one small area like Kware? in the full view of the security and administrative structures without uh, government coming to know. And the same thing happened to Shakahola. And I would want to hear what is it that you would intend to do to make sure that there is um, restoration of administrative and security structures right at the village uh, level uh, uh, to secure our country. Mr. Speaker, sir, it is true there is work that requires to be done to ensure that the people of Kenya enjoy their constitutional right and freedom to assemble, picket, and demonstrate, and present petitions to public authorities, while at the same time maintaining public order and also ensuring the rights of other people. Before I was dismissed on the 11th of July, I had actually finalized the draft regulations to the Public Code Act, which uh, uh, will be the statutory, impl uh, statutory imp instrument to be processed for purposes of giving effect to the enjoyment of that right, not to curtail that right because a statute cannot curtail a constitutional right, but to give effect to how that right will be exercised. 
those draft regulations, when, when completed, will be able to help the police do a number of things. Number one, obligate the police to escort protesters and provide security for them, but also to ensure protesters don't run amok and overrun members of the public who are not protesting. Number three, it will require those protesting to notify the police and tell and, and also give the number of protesters so that uh, the appropriate arrangements are made. It will also obligate public institutions in all arms of government, all public institutions to designate an area within their premises or within the vicinity of their premises where a group of protesters who want to present petitions can, can stand, demonstrate, and present petitions to th that uh, public office or that public institution. That, those regulations also will, um, will of course, um, uh, ask protesters to also be responsible for their own conduct. And therefore, we hope that if I am approved, this is a, a low-hanging matter. It's something that we can process in the shortest time possible to avoid a situation like what we've had in the past one month of, um, of uh, protests which are unmanaged, unmanaged and which have exposed us to deaths and destruction of property and a lot of inconvenience to the people of Kenya. On the second question by the leader of the majority party, it is true that um, we have experienced um, a number of um, the security incidents that uh, should not have happened in the first place. And let me say that first and foremost, the Shakahola incident didn't happen when it became public. It uh, happened over quite a number of years, and it's an indictment actually on um, our ability as a country to to be able to prevent uh, some of these uh, sophisticated crimes from hurting our people. I am on record to having, having ap apologized on behalf of previous and the present administration for that breach because the radicalization and the criminal activity around Shakahola be, began in 2019-2020. But the manifestation in terms of people uh, dying and being married, uh, being buried, was um, something that happened sometimes in 2022. And uh, the Shakahola incidents will remain the most uh, tragic security breach in the history of our country. We have never had a security breach of that magnitude in our country. We have learned the lessons. Two days ago, the task force that the president had appointed has helped to give us some of the recommendations on what we need to do to avoid uh, that going forward, but also we believe that the public officials, including security officers who are in charge, must also have their day in being made accountable. We had proposed the establishment of a commission of inquiry to help us uh, put together the accountability process so that we can have recommendations on prosecution and, and other action, but the Commission of Inquiry was stopped by our courts, um, and we were unable to move. But with or without the Commission of Inquiry, I want to assure the people of Kenya, if I am approved, one of my priorities will be to make sure that the accountability for the crimes in Shakahola by public officials, including security managers of all arms, of all agencies of the state, must proceed as a way of uh, making sure 
that we do not have this kind of thing happening again. It is true also recently we had an incident which is actively under uh, investigations around quarry area. Again, the same reasons, gaps in the Ngao and Nyumba Kumi structures and also our intelligence collection uh, ability. And I just want to, to say that now that we have finalized the proposals and we know what we need to do to reform our National Police Service, my next assignment, if I am approved by this House, will be to initiate far-reaching reforms in the national government administration uh, um, uh, system to ensure that we restructure the Ngao system, make it more responsive, modernize it, and distribute it to the lowest level in a manner which uh, helps us to avoid incidents like this when we have serious security breaches, uh, yet we have government officials paid by the people of Kenya to make sure that the country is safe. So I want to admit those who are un 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 a very um, unfortunate incidents and um, national security being a, a work in progress and a perpetual project, we have learned the lessons and we are going to make sure that we strengthen and seal the gaps to ensure that we make our homeland safer than it has been before. Thank you. Minority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, I would like to ask the nominee, Professor Abraham, that, uh, Mr. Speaker, it, Mr. Chairman, he is one of the two people who have been reappointed to the cabinet to the same docket that they were serving previously, the last two years. I want to ask you a question, Professor, that what do you think makes you f feel that you can serve in that docket again? Because why I'm asking that question is because if you look at what happened in the last two months in this country, the, the demonstrations and the kind of thing that happened, in my view, you look like somebody was lost. Your presence was not being felt. Your uh, omnipresence was not being felt, if I may say so. Because you could see abductions were happening, human rights abuses were happening, but the minister's voice was not being heard in that situation. What do you think, what makes you think that you can serve again in the same docket? But the next question is that you have also seen widely, you have been widely accused the last two months or the last one year that you, you've presided over human rights abuses from time you've been appointed CS till last month. Particularly what happened, for example, on 25th of July, 2024. And also during the Azimio demonstrations last year, more than 75 Kenyans lost their lives. And last month also, more than 50 Kenyans lost their lives. So there's a feeling that the national police response to protest is stuck in the old way of doing things. So the question is, to, to what extent do you think ministerial responsibility for the brutality meted on Kenyans by security organs? At what level do you think you can take responsibility for that? What do you ways are you going now to do to, to stop that? So my question is, in spite of all these abuses that have happened, in spite of all the problems that Kenyans have encountered, what is this new idea that you will employ this time if you are approved by this house? Because one of the things we are looking at, Professor, is, Chair, is Chairman, is the suitability of the person to hold that office. What makes you think you are suitable in spite of all those problems that you have encountered the last two months? Thank you, Chair. Professor, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir, and honorable members. I was in office for 21 months, 623 days. I can account for each and every day of my stay in office. I woke up every day and my focus has been to ensure that our country is safe. I have risen 
before dawn every day including Sundays and gone to sleep very late simply because of the demands of our homeland security. I believe that I am suitable for reappointment because during those 21 months, during those six, 23 days, I have been able to keep the country fairly safe, especially in the fight against terror. Previously, we had an escalation around 2021-2022 of terror attacks in northern Kenya and the Pony Enclave. And in the past two years, approximately, we've had stability in northern Kenya and Lamu. I believe I am suitable, Honorable Speaker, because the crime of banditry has been reduced significantly in my estimation by more than 75 percent even if pockets of insecurity continue to be experienced and we do know where the gaps are and what needs to be done to even uh, bring uh, this problem to a complete end mr speaker i have visited all the 47 counties some of the counties numerous times I've been to Lamu 21 times in 21 months. I've been to Samburu eight times. I've been to Baringo 13 times. I've been to many other counties. And therefore, I have not been lazy. I've been diligent. And I've conducted myself within the parameters of Article 73, which requires me to conduct myself in a manner that brings honor to the nation and dignity to the office I hold. I have worked with officers at the headquarters, but I've also sat down in numerous meetings to work with officers at regional, county, and sub-county levels to make sure that we share decision-making processes and decision implementation processes. I believe, Mr. Speaker, the question has been directed to the events of the recent uh, weeks. And I want to respond as follows. That the reason that I didn't talk every day is because the events the Honorable Member is referring to were mainly operational issues. The work of the Minister, the Cabinet Secretary for Interior, as envisaged in Article 245 of the Constitution, is to give the organs of national security that fall under that ministry policy direction and policy guidance. And in particular, because we are talking about the police, Mr. Speaker, the police is under independent command, Article 245, Paragraph 2. There are only two people who can give the Inspector General of Police directives. First, the Cabinet Secretary for Interior, but only on policy issues. Number two, the Cabinet uh, sorry, the Director of Public Prosecutions in matters in investigations of criminal activities. Other than that, operational matters are handled by the command of the National Police Service, and, and therefore the Minister doesn't give operational directives. We have communicated the policy during my time in office, the policy of the Kenya Kwanzaa Administration on policing, which includes zero tolerance on extrajudicial killings, zero tolerance on abuse of human rights, and restraints in the use of force. Limited only, the use of force being limited only to cases contemplated in the Constitution and the National Police Service 
act and the schedule they are to in the defense of life of the officer or the life of the people of Kenya. Therefore, it is unfortunate that during a recent uh, uh, protest, we witnessed the death of 42 Kenyans. We also had injuries, 486 civilians and 385 police officers were injured. We had about 1,387 uh, arrests. We had 54 police cars destroyed and 110 motor vehicles belonging to the people of Kenya also destroyed in those protests. And therefore, I want to submit as follows that the operational responsibility of policing lies with the command of the National Police Service. It is my estimation that on a broader scale of things, generally, the police tried their best to protect the country against mobs of criminals, arsonists, and other dangerous people, including those who visited parliament and wanted to kill parliamentarians and other people. The police did their best. And in the event, as it is possible, that any officer went beyond what is allowed in terms of the use of force, it is now the work of the independent police oversight authority and other accountability agencies to help the country to bring to closure the issue of justice for excess use of force. I want to submit as follows, Mr. Speaker, that even beyond the police having independent operational command, the issue of the use of firearms by a police officer is individual. If you read the National Police Service uh, uh, Act and the Schedule 6 to that Act, every police officer has individual responsibility on how they use firearms. You cannot, the Inspector General of Police will not be there to tell the police, uh, the, 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 the officer, shoot this one, don't shoot this one. There will be an operational order that will generally guide the police officer. So the accountability of the IG will be on the operational order, which is publicly available, whether that operational order met the constitutional threshold, but the use of force by individual officers is an individual responsibility issue other than that, I commend generally those officers who try their best in very difficult circumstances to help the country come to terms with what happened and hope and will see to it, if I am reappointed, that the accountability for those who violated the law is pursued conclusively, I submit. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, this question will just require yes or no, so to, then I'll be able to ask the next one. So, Professor Kindiki, are you aware that for the last two years we have internally displaced persons in parts of the North Rift, that is Samburu County, parts of Baringo, Elgeyo, Marakwet, and other parts of the North Rift? It's a yes or no? Yes. So, if this committee finds you suitable to hold this office again, what measures will you put in place to see that these families go back to their homes and especially school ch going children will go back to school and people can go back to their homes and live peacefully? Uh, Mr. Speaker, allow me to ask the last question, which is also, are you aware that there are people in the North Rift who were killed in broad daylight 
in marketplaces, in towns, for example, in Samburu West, in Suguta town, there have been abductions. And this current administration, which you served in during its campaigns and has continuously said that you will not have issues of um, abductions, issues of extrajudicial killings, but I want to put it across to you that it has been happening. There are people in those counties who are missing to date. They have been abducted. I want to ask you whether you're aware, and we have sufficient been informed that it is alleged that it is security officers who have abducted these people. Is that one of your measures of ensuring insecurity is settled in these areas? And do you think as a professor of constitutionalism and, con and ensuring we follow the constitution, is that the right way in ensuring fair justice even to those who are accused? Professor? Mr. Speaker, the now that the kinetic operations that we launched in February 2023 has yielded significant fruits, the issue of uh, the North Rift will not be complete until those that were displaced because of the violence meted upon them by bandits, groups, and gangs are returned to their homes. And therefore, it is going to be my priority, if I am approved by this House, to make sure that in line with the rights of every Kenyan under the Constitution and the relevant instruments, including international instruments on the prevention of internal displacement. We're going to resettle, facilitate the resettlement and reintegration of all communities that were, dispo uh, dis uh, that were displaced by the menace of banditry. Secondly, I've been asked to respond to the allegations about abduction. During my tenure as minister, I made it clearly, um, I made it clear to the police that abductions, extrajudicial killings, and extra constitutional means of apprehending offenders is against government policy, is against the constitution, is against international law. I must hasten to say my observation, because I have been in the front line more than any other place, especially in North Rift, in Northern Kenya, and the Boni Enclave. The officers who served in the special units in counter-terrorism and counter-banditry, the formed up units have been quite professional, generally. But just as I've said in the previous question, in the event there are any infractions, there are any reported infractions and excesses by the special forces that are helping us to fight banditry, again, IPOA and other accountability mechanisms must be put in place to ensure that we do not spoil the very good work that is being done by our officers in the front line. Some of them have died, others have lost limb. Officers have been destitute. Point of order, Chair, yeah. Chairman, I was saying that uh, you know the nominees are professor and professors teach in the university, so he can answer questions like someone who's in class uh, teaching us. Uh, I was requesting through the chair that, through the chairman, that he can do faster, chair. <coughs> Professor, be concise and precise and to the point. I submit. Thank you. Uh, Nelson, we'll just come around. Yes. Um, thank you, Honorable Speaker. Um, Professor Kindiki, it's unprecedented that twice in two years we've had to apply 
Section 241 of our Constitution in uh, deploying our officers, our military officers, to back up the police, both uh, to quell the protest and initially sent to the North Rift. What exactly is the state of our police force? There are so many things that are flying around gossip that number one, our officers, police officers could be uh, demoralized. Number two, um, is, is there a situation that you feel the police at some point are very hesitant to execute some of the assignments they are given because of lack of morale? And you as a CS, the accusations that you've not helped in boosting um, the morale of our police officers. What exactly is the state of our police force? Professor? Mr. Speaker, um, yes, we have applied Article 241 twice. And I think there is nothing abnormal with that, Mr. Speaker, because that is why that article exists, so that whenever there is need, uh, the National Police Service may request the support of the Kenya Defense Forces to handle either an emergency or a disastrous situation. On the case of the North Rift, it was important to get the support of the KDF because at that time we didn't, the National Police Air Wing had collapsed. Right now it's operational. Uh, we didn't have air assets. We didn't have uh, adequate long range and manned aerial vehicles and therefore we needed the support of the military. But uh, the Air Force in North Rift is police led. In fact, the military has, has been supportive in the peripheries, police-led. Even in terms of numbers, uh, we have 4,500 police officers against less than 1,000 KDF officers. With the regard to the recent uh, emergency we had, again, um, what we had on 25th of June was unprecedented. and. Our calling of the KDF was simply to put them on standby should they be needed. And you've seen they have not been needed. But it was a precaution because the criminals who wanted to ban parliament were also threatening to ban state house and other critical installations. So if that was not reason enough, to put KDF on standby legally, I don't think any other situation uh, would have uh, met threshold because what we faced in the last month, in our view, was existential threat, not just to the arms of government, but to the state itself. And, um, and therefore, the police is in good uh, shape. There are issues of welfare which we are handling. I've already mentioned about the salary increments which we have started implementing. There is issues around um, housing. There are also issues about uh, uh, about um, the, the leave and and so forth and so on. Medication. I've just talked about the hospital that we've uh, established for them, fully fledged level four hospital. We have one for the border police again, which again we operationalized under my leadership in Canyonio for the formed up units. So yes, there is more to be done, but it is not true to say that the police force is demoralized. They have done a good job, and when it's necessary, we have called in the KDF in accordance with the law when we feel that the situation is an emergency. I submit. Proceeding. I thank the Honourable Speaker for giving me this opportunity. Uh, Professor and Honourable Chair, the Chairman, I want to rely on uh, Section... I'm on this side, uh, Professor. I want to rely on Section 6 and Section 7 of the Act in terms of suitability of the candidate the position he has been nominated. And in this respect, Honourable Speaker, I want to take the Minister in terms of suitability, on his credibility in terms of respecting what he says, in terms of implementing what he says. Because he's been, the, this is the second time he's been given a chance 
and uh, and uh, uh, um, speaker i want also to nominate to know that absence of war is not necessarily peace whatever is happening in the north rift honorable speaker there is relative peace uh, there's no war but it might not necessarily mean peace what am i saying honorable speaker the candidate as an example the candidate came to the north rift we had engagement as leaders of the north rift and specifically West Pogot County, as an example of the entire country. I don't know what happened, so what the minister did in the other places. But possibly, maybe he did what he did in West Pogot, which is, we agreed on a number of issues, honorable speaker, in terms of strategies of bringing peace, including establishment of uh, sub-locations or bringing even the security near to the people so that we avoid the shakawala things and so on. And the minister agreed with the honorable speaker with us uh, in West Pogot. And, and, and we also agreed to put uh, security in, in, in strategic areas. It might happen in other parts of the country. The minister agreed. And speaker, nothing happened. <coughs> nothing has happened so far. Now, if the if parliament sees it fit and approves the minister again for this position, what's going to happen? What is the minister going to do different, honorable speaker, to gain credibility among people, among Kenyans themselves, who might feel that the minister lied to them? And finally, speaker, take home for the minister. This idea of giving police uh, accounting as an accounting uh, or, or to manage their own money as an accounting officer, I want the minister to take home in terms of the security, the strategic security of this country. What does that mean in terms of security of this country? Going into the future, there are critics, honorable speaker, that say, how do you give the police the gun and also give them the money? What's going to happen? It might pose a serious security in this country going forward, maybe many years in the future. I thank you, honorable speaker. Professor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, <coughs> it is true Those that... Those are just two simple questions. Did you honor what you did and said in Pokot? And is the police fund tenable? Very simple. Mr. Speaker, it is true that uh, some of the things that I promised have not been realized, especially the issue of um, operationalization of new administrative units. Uh, but it is also true that some of the things I promised have been realized, and I thought the Honorable Member would be kind enough to notify the House and the country that during the same consultations I had promised that we will provide train and equip 200 national police reservists for West Pocot, which we did. Number two, we had promised to set up a security camp at a place formerly called Lami Nyeusi, which is now called Lami Nyeupe, which we did and so many other things we did. But the issue of the units is outstanding, uh, and not just for West Pokot, but also for a few other country, uh, counties, including some parts of Baringo, Samburu, and a few other counties that did not benefit from the uh, operationalization of units. And that is work that we are going to complete if we are reappointed. On the second question, the I do not think there is a problem with giving the National Police Service money and control over resources relating to their operations. The operational budget of the police must be run by the National Police Service themselves and not by the ministry, not by the office of the president. And in my view, if there are issues of um, lack of effectiveness, it is not because the police have their own budget. If anything, it should help them even work more efficiently. Therefore, the question should be, now that the police have their operational budget, what prevents them from serving the people of Kenya in a better manner? And those are issues that we'll be looking at uh, if we are reappointed. In any case, Parliament oversights the use of that money. Ukakikaria? Thank you, Chair. <coughs> uh, Professor Kendike, uh, in the recent past in this demonstration, two young men, Michael Kihunga Nyagodhie and uh, another young man called Kevin Maganga, were shot dead in Nakuru. The family has been trying to get some 
information from my port. Uh, it is alleged that the independent, uh, the IPO is not receiving required information from the police service. This has posed a great challenge to IPO, executing its oversight mandate. If approved for this appointment, Honorable Kindike, what steps will you take to ensure that the two institutions work seamlessly uh, for the benefit of Kenyans? And secondly, how further, how uh, further, how will you strengthen IPOA so as to execute uh, its mandate? Second, the honourable uh, chair is about urban criminal gang activities. Uh, uh, in in uh, the urban areas, particularly in Nakuru, a, a criminal gang called Confirm, which by what the citizens claim has brought about five deaths in every month and hundreds of injuries. Maybe if you're approved and confirmed, how, what are the steps that you'll take to reduce the increase of criminal activities in urban areas and particularly in Akuru, specifically the confirmed criminal gang? Thank you, Chair. Professor. Mr. Speaker, on the first issue, the relationship between IPOA and the National Police Service is an ongoing uh, conversation. And it is not, a, it's not unusual. It, is, uh, it happens all over the world that the police and the bodies of oversight to them have no more institutional tensions. We have, during our, our tenure in office, we have encouraged these institutions to work together because each one of them is playing an important role. It is the same problem we had between the police service and the police service commission. And we did a lot of work and, and, and around that and, and were able to get a win-win a situation where the commission and the police service are working together. So we'll apply the same methods if we are reappointed to make sure that IPOA gets the support it requires from the NPS. And uh, going forward, we will support IPOA in terms of more resources, more capacity, but also just brokering the institutional goodwill between themselves and the police. The second question, uh, Mr. Speaker, is on um, the criminal gangs. It is true. We have had um, a gang in Nakuru known as CONFIRM. Um, and, and, and urban crime is a major, major, major issue. When I took over as a CS for Interior uh, October 2022, there was a lot of gang violence and gang crime in Nairobi. We were, we've been able to reduce and suppress uh, the Nairobi urban criminal activity significantly. We hope that um, the Nakuru matter uh, could, could also be resolved. And uh, before I was dismissed from office, I had, um, I had a meeting with the leaders of Nakuru County, and uh, we had agreed that uh, according to the feedback the leaders gave us, we needed to change the command because sometimes many of these um, uh, 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 performance issues are based on uh, the right command. So we are going to work on it to ensure that we eliminate that gang and other urban gangs in Mombasa and a few other towns that are suffering the same problem. Robert Mbui. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, Professor, Kenya's constitution borrows very heavily from the US one, particularly issues to do with the Bill of Rights. And you swore to uphold this constitution and protect it. Recently, you saw in the US that a gunman tried to shoot a pres presidential nominee and uh, was actually brought down. But despite that, and even missed, but despite that, uh, the head of uh, Secret Service resigned their post. Now, in Kenya, during your tenure as CS, uh, over 100 Kenyans have been killed, murdered by the police. Um, you know that uh, maybe over 1,000 people have been injured. 
and uh, property worth uh, billions of shillings has been destroyed. Not to forget that a lot of Kenyans have also been abducted and as we are talking there are still people, families that are still looking for their loved ones. Now, um, I, we did see that the, the Inspector General of Police resigned. Do you think that uh, as a CS you should not also have taken responsibility political responsibility for that failure that the resignation confirms and also either resigned or uh, declined the, 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 the appointment. It's also important to note that uh, during these demos that were held, um, a lot of uh, people were, 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 were shot. And there is clamor and request and, uh, you know, for, for, for justice. In fact, uh, I've attended one of them was a constituent, Erickson Muticia, and we've gone to those funerals, and the families are asking for justice. You have forensic evidence because you have the bullets, and you know that every bullet that comes from a gun can be traced. Why have we not seen arrests and uh, you know, arraignment in court of the police officers that are accused or that were involved in these shootings? Because that would appease the public a little bit. Uh, allow me, Mr. Speaker, to also point out that... Uh, the CS has had, uh, sorry, um, the nominee has had a very illustrious career. And, uh, you know, PhD, you've done consultancy all over. And uh, when you are here for the uh, approval hearings in 2022, after all those many years of, uh, of working, your wealth was at 544 million. Now, two years later, uh, your wealth now is at 694 million. That is a whooping 150 million shillings more. Maybe you could explain to us, is this increase probably related to the office that you hold? It would be important for us to know. And finally, Mr. Speaker. Too many issues. questions, Robert. Mr. Speaker, just one last one, because we are, we are, we are doing very well with time, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> that, just la one last one, yes. which is because I'm just uh, picking out some of the things that some of the members have said yes. on the matters of insecurity and criminal gangs, Mr. Speaker, that have been out there mugging our people. There's burglaries. You know, at the, in, the, in the North Rift, there are all these issues of um, uh, cattle wrestling and all that, which you have admitted there are issues. Now, my question is, when you know that we have such insecurity in the country, what was the logic behind making a decision to send a thousand police officers to go and secure a Haiti when Kenya has a problem? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Professor. Mr. Speaker, those are three questions. Uh, the first one, um, the Honorable Boy asked about um, whether I should have resigned. The example the member gave up about U.S., where the, president, the candidate for presidency was uh, nearly killed, uh, raises a number of issues. One, he says the person who attempted that was killed. That, that demonstrates use of force, even in our local context, is allowed because nobody raised issues with uh, that criminal who was wanted to kill Donald Trump. He was shot dead without questions. Number two, uh, the honorable member has said that the, the director of the Secret Service resigned, but also drew a parallel and said our IG also resigned. The minister did not resign in the US. I don't know why the Kenyan minister must resign. <laughs> And nobody asked the minister to resign because ministers don't instruct operations, they instruct policy. I can only resign if my policy instruction is unconstitutional or illegal. Then uh, on the question of those uh, unfortunate incidents when Kenyans lost their lives and the quest for justice, I strongly believe that there must be justice and every death that occurred must be accounted for. However, Mr. Speaker, the process of putting together criminal investigations, including forensic evidence, is not something that can be done, can be rushed. It takes a bit of time all over the world, not just in Kenya. I believe IPOA should help the country to get closure and I have promised if I am reappointed I'll encourage the collaboration and support and goodwill between IPO and the police in terms of providing information so that justice is served. I have also been asked about 
my wealth, which has increased from 544 million to 694 million. It is true uh, because, first let me start by saying that I have not benefited from any improper business. I have not done any business with government. Let's start from there. I have not applied for any tender by myself, by proxy, by relative, or by anybody. As a speaker, before I was appointed, my wealth was at 544 million. I said at that time, which I still do now, that I have run a business, which today, I do not participate in that business. I don't um, practice law. But my law firm is a life and working. And much of that revenue has actually come through uh, the revenue from my law firm, which is still active, but being managed by other people. I think all my salary and allowances have been spent um, in paying bills. Therefore, uh, most of uh, um, the increment in my net worth is uh, because of three things. One, uh, the legal fees, some of which was actually pending by the time I was being appointed. And I said it here that there are some unpaid legal fees, which some of them were paid. In fact, I remember two months after I was uh, appointed, one of the clients paid a significant amount of legal fees, which had been pending. Uh, other than that, I do small businesses and so forth and so on. None of my money has come from the public except the salary and the allowances that I'm entitled to. Lastly, on Haiti, it is true that the government of Kenya, through the National Security Council, deployed, decided to deploy our officers in Haiti, pursuant to a request by the UN Security Council and the UN General Assembly. This is an international obligation. It has not affected our operations. And it is not true to say that since there are problems in Kenya, we cannot also do our international obligations because the all countries in the world do have security issues. They have security matters. Even the country you consider safest has its own security matters. And therefore, it is a great honor for our officers who serve in Haiti. So far, they are doing a good job. I believe they will profile Kenya properly. They will bring honor to our country. And that deployment has not affected our operational capabilities, I submit. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Uh, like your neighbor, ask one question. I'll, I'll ask only one question, <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Uh, Professor Kithure Kindiki, in your first stint as uh, CS Interior, you were associated with uh, strong statements, such as we will crush you, you know, you'll be met with the full force of the law, we will deal with you firmly and deadly, and many other words like that. Statements which seem to fuel police extrajudicial action. And um, uh, Kenyans have taken uh, 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 notice of such statements that probably they feel well police uh, extrajudicial action and uh, the use of excessive force. Because if you tell people will crush you, the police will crush you. That's what it will entail. As uh, you see now, there's a new awakening in this country about what uh, public officers are saying. How different will you be as you if we approve you? Secondly, you are also. Uh, uh, the civilian face uh, among the police and you know the the security organs that we have, but uh, as you took up this job, probably uh, Professor Kindik, you became more of them, more of a police officer, not a civilian within. You are donning police uniform, you are all over police choppers, and you, you know you you behave like a police officer. 
uh, which probably took you away from the police direction that you're supposed to give the, 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 for, the forces and became more of a, an operational leader instead of a policy director in the force. Um, uh, how will you be different uh, on this? And probably lastly, you are more on, in the sky than on earth. You know, uh, when you want to give policy direction, you want to give guiding, you need to be in office, have meetings, boardrooms, and give policy direction. But uh, you have said you actually went to Lamu 21 days, 21 times in 21 months. And uh, probably, in the operation field more than where you are required to give, uh, you know, operational uh, or to give policy guidance and direction. And that's why the police force and uh, the, the administration, national government administration, is not properly coordinated. How different will you be as we, uh, when we approve you as CSA? Thank you. Professor? If. Mr. Speaker, thank you. I've been asked to say whether I'll change my language. Mr. Speaker, I need to clarify that it is true I have used very, very unique language. But, Mr. Speaker, this is security language. And the people I address when I use those terminologies are not the law-abiding citizens of Kenya. The people I address with that difficult terminology or unique terminology are terrorists, bandits, organized criminals. Those are the people I tell will crush you, and, and I mean it. Last time I appeared before here, the member for Samburu West asked me what I will do in Kurkur and other places when criminals descend into gorges, and I'll say I'll flatten the gorges. We've done a bit of that. There were places in Baringo, Corcoran Hills, a place called Tandare, a place called Ngelecha, and in Samburu, the Malasco, Malaso Valley, and other places where criminals would always retreat and have a field day, operate from there. We've neutralized them and removed them from there. So, I again, the use of force is permitted by law, depending on who that force is used against and in what circumstances. And the escalation methods are used. You start by asking them to surrender. If they don't, you use other methods until if they challenge you or they, they want to kill police officers, the police officers will kill them before they kill the officer. That is the law. Mr. Speaker, on the second issue, I have been uh, there at headquarters driving policy uh, in boardrooms, Arambe House, I've had so many meetings in our campuses, in Kiganjo, in um, Embakasi, Roiro, Police Leadership Academy. But I've also been in the field more. Why? To disseminate policy to our forward operating bases, to our camps, to our officers in the field, in the counties. And even in the counties, before I even start my meetings, I would sit with the county security committee in a boardroom, disseminate the policy, because they are the ones who will be left to implement. And I have also been in the most dangerous spots in our territory, with our officers in the front line. Why? To give them moral support that we have not posted them there to die. We have posted them there to protect the country. And there is no greater moral booster than for the security minister to go and visit the officers, have lunch with them, encourage them, and tell them what the government policy is and what the government thinks about them. So it has been very rewarding. I will be back in the normal manner, but I will, of course, balance between my headquarters work and also the field work. Lastly, I've been asked to, to land. I have always landed. For every flight, I have landed. And finally, on the issue of uh, uniform, what I wear is tactical attire. 
because there are some things which a protective clothing that you need tactical wear to be able to have protective clothing and protective facilities because you're in a dangerous situation. I don't wear that on the streets of Nairobi. And also, and also, the, I have been in not just police helicopters, but military helicopters, because the law provides that the security minister be facilitated when he is in a dangerous situations. The Minister for Interior, the Minister for Defense must be facilitated because the nature of our work is we are exposed to risk and danger uh, by virtue of, uh, of office. Otherwise, I do not fancy it's only that uh, it's all in a day's job. Morugara. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> On a CS, let me, CS nominee, let me take you away from the police officers, the bandits, and uh, all these other insecurity matters you're dealing with, back to national government administration. I recollect it very well that when you were here, we actually questioned you on it lastly during the vetting and emphasized that the DAF center of the national government administration is in the villages that we do have uh, very serious workers in the villages who possibly are not recognized by the national government, but who play a key role in uh, the service and security provision and everything else so that we can avert incidents like the Shakahola and the quarry incidents we've talked about. Here I'm talking about the village elders and the Nyumakumi workers whom you use extensively 24 hours uh, every day, every month and every year and in a form of service which is very similar to servitude or some form of modern day slavery. These people are not remunerated. Your response that time was that a policy was going to be put in place immediately and that they would actually start getting a form of remuneration. The question I have to you is, how far has that gone and when should these people expect their paycheck? Whether check, whether M-Pesa, whether whatever is going to be, when should they expect to be paid? Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, we have finalized the Village Elders Bill 2024. It is one of the 12 pieces of legislation that are awaiting cabinet approval for transmission to Parliament, and uh, therefore that matter will be sorted out in the shortest time possible, I submit. Um, Waziri, I want you to again go back to Haiti, where we actually deployed uh, almost 600 uh, police officers. My fear now is that uh, with what is happening around there, the, the fact one of my voters at home has one of his uh, son actually deployed. And the question is, how secure? Do you have special security insurance for this particular, just in case um, uh, something has happened? Of course, that has led to um, a deficit of uh, police officers. That's why when you had demonstration here, you had to get in the army because we don't have enough uh, police officers. Uh, uh, so of course, some of them are away. Secondly, I also have had a case in North Rift, in fact, my colleague is just walking in, the North Rift, where you have this uh, uh, police, police reservist have been disarmed, and yet we have problem in North Rift. And those are my borders, and we have that problem. And yet you have actually disarmed uh, the police reservist. What are you doing about that? Professor, I will take Daoud, not the questions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the CS nominee, you have promised regarding passports a couple of times, and you know passports are the most important. 
um, you initially said within a day, within a week, within two weeks, but apparently the passport issue has not been sorted out. The other issue is regarding the IDs. Um, your department has <coughs> rolled out that IDs will be 10 years, whereas we have known all along IDs w did not have an expiry date. What informed the decision for that one? Because now we've got Maisha number which has been uh, already declared unconstitutional. But what was the point of launching Maisha number when we had a Huduma number which did not work? So now first was we've got the original ID, now Huduma number, now Maisha number. So aren't we confusing everything? Can't we have just one, the ID to be upgraded instead of all those and data protection? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Professor, you can answer those from Ferdinand and uh, Rahim. Mr. Speaker, with regard to the question by the member for Kwanzaa, um, Haiti is a United Nations mission. Therefore, our officers are covered, insured, paid for by the United Nations, um, and, and, and therefore there is no cause of alarm. But it's also good to report good progress so far because the officers, they have been able to get part of the critical infrastructure, the port, the airport, the main police station have been recovered and the hospital have been recovered from the gangs. And some of the gang leaders who were taunting us before have even signed for peace and are willing to engage. So they are doing a good job. We are praying for them. We hope there will be no um, un untoward incidents. With regard to the second issue from the member for Kwanzaa, it is true uh, we disarmed 400 national police reservists uh, who were serving in Transoya. And uh, there was a reason, because the NPRs were being misused Number two, Transoia is fairly peaceful, except along the border, small issues. So we will be vetting and returning on a needs basis a smaller number of NPRs, but the number of 400 NPRs in Transoia was disproportionate with the challenge that we have in that county compared to other counties that are a little more needy. Uh, then finally, the member for Imenti North asked about passports. When I assumed office, the passport was a crisis like no other. Um, Kenyans were waiting for a year, six months, three months, eight months. They were bribing. They had to bribe to get passports. We had no printers and so forth and so on. Today. We have not only paid the pending bills to the suppliers, we have enough printing equipment for, for personalization of passports. We have even upscaled our system, that is the ICT system, and we have cleared the backlog for, from 784,000 when it was at the highest, and today, there is no backlog. We are issuing passports within seven days, starting 1st of August, today. That was our deadline. We complied with that deadline four weeks ago, at the beginning of July. Our next deadline is therefore to bring the passport waiting period to three days by 1st of November this year. And we are on course. I am very happy. This is one area where we've made a lot of progress. Um, of course, there are small challenges uh, here and there. Uh, we believe that um, we've not eradicated the corrupt staff completely. We have new, a new crop of staff, uh, about 120. But we are not sure that uh, corruption has been eradicated from that directorate. And we are working on that to ensure, we'll be working on that if we are approved to ensure that we clean up the whole place. With regard to IDs and, pass and, 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 and Uruma number and Maisha number, 
the reason for the 10-year limit is because of technology. Because unlike the the ID that we are used to, this, the second generation ID we have, the third generation ID is, is a technology cut. And technology keeps on growing old. And therefore, that's why we have a 10-year uh, period. And that's why even passports, they normally have a time frame. You cannot have a passport for life. That is the idea. It is not to punish uh, Kenyans. The card has a bit of technology chips, and we want to upgrade that uh, chip based on the security threats that will be identified uh, by that time. The Maisha um, a, a, a number issue is uh, before court. We hope we will vacate the orders that were issued two days ago because the problem we are having with delays with issuance of IDs is because of court orders. Last year, between November and f March this year, there was a court injunction against us issuing IDs, which brought a huge backlog of almost 600,000. We cleared that backlog. We were actually left with 92,000. Uh, with those in the waiting list. And then another court injunction was issued again uh, two days ago. We hope we'll be, vac be vacating it by Friday, hopefully, so that we can be able to move on with issuing ideas to the people of Kenya. I submit. Emasi. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Let me take you to the budget. Following the recent government budget cuts across all sectors, how, how, what innovative ways will you use to mitigate the negative impacts of, of the budget cuts in the Ministry of Interior and National, uh, and, and National Security? Secondly, what will you prioritize if, if approved? What programs will you prioritize? And what will be the impact of implementing those priorities? And Kenyans are also asking, because of the, uh, the unemployment situation in the country, is the recruitment of police officers affected by the budget cuts? And if not, what innovative ways, again, will you use to recruit them differently? Because as a stance, Kenyans are concerned that recruitment of police officers has become a preserve of the rich or of those who can afford to sell some land. So how are you going to make sure that employment opportunities in the Ministry of Interior are open to all Kenyans, irrespective of their tribe, their religion, where they come from, whether they have money or not? Thank you. I hold Professor. Yes, uh, Missy, take those two. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Prof, you, you'll go down the history as uh, uh, the first minister to be vetted twice in one term one presidential term. Of course, the others who are coming, but for now you are the first, and that history will not be, uh, will be there forever. And I'll take you back to what you said in the Senate, mm. that history is replete with strong and powerful dictators who are brought down by the power of the people. And I dare say you've been brought back here to this vetting by the power of the people. Uh, I want to refer you to an event, because you are a member of the National Security Council. This is the core of the, the security of this nation. I want to refer you to an event in history in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis, something I know you are much aware of because you are a, an international law student or professor. Uh, during this time, the then president of US, uh, JF Kennedy, uh, we had a standoff with the Soviet Union, uh, Nikita Khrushchev. And, and the, it, there was an ex, ex -com, committee members, comprising of 14 members, almost akin to what we have here as uh, National Security Council. All those 14 members agreed that to deploy, deploy, deploy. It took JF Kennedy brother's advice uh, to do otherwise. I'm not asking you to be uh, consulting your brother. But if it were not for the brothers' advice, then we could have experienced the first nuclear war um, to the de destruction of the world. Now, I, I look at the events that have happened here as a result of either good or bad decision of the National Security Council. 
and just like uh, somebody said that there is always an inclination towards consensus even if a decision is bad that the committee of people could easily incline towards psychological consensus to the destruction or to the results of a bad decision does national security council of this republic also suffer from groupthink groupthink in a way that there is no devil's advocate to give an alternative decision making that can save the country then speaker if you may allow me the last very brief uh, you've tried to explain the donning of the uniform uh, the police uniform what surprises me prof is that uh, you give instructions to police you give press conferences you are adorned in the uniform of the police but when it comes to the the crimes committed against humanity by the police that's where you say the police are independent how independent is your uniform professor thank you mr speaker mr speaker with regard to the budget cuts we will prioritize what we consider the five biggest national security threats in our programming and uh, those are the threats of terror organized crime drugs um, the need for drug uh, controlling uh, narcotic drugs uh, the fight against um, climate change and also extremism uh, in its various forms religious political or whatever extremism because extreme behavior can annihilate the nation uh, with regard to um, recruitment um, going forward we will ensure that each and every Kenyan boy or girl who is recruited can be accounted for because in the past uh, we've had so many claims of corruption and so many claims of favoritism and therefore going forward it's uh, is going to be demanded from the police that they account for every recruitment slot that they fill we have a big problem of corruption in the country and we hope the national police leadership academy and the programs we want to put there as we look for succession management and new managers of security will be able to be able to fight corruption in the national police service mr speaker uh, the honorable amici asked me uh, for, i think the first was just a, content, a comment he said i've been brought here by the power of people and i want to say uh, happily yes happily yes with regard to the second um and i say happily because it's it's important for public officials to be put under scrutiny and be measured using the highest possible threshold so i have no i have no issues i have no problem even if i'm brought here 20 times i will happily come up and try and explain myself to the people of kenya and to the representatives of the people of kenya i've been asked the second one the last one uh, from the honorable amici was on um, whether the national security council is uh, suffering from um, groupthink and the answer is no i submit uh mukami honorable uh, mukami uh, thank you honorable speaker honorable speaker uh, i want to ask uh, our wazir one question uh, from a police officer who is uh, concerned i understand there is a court battle in the court since 2018 between the police constables there are those who are earning higher salaries than the others that means there are those who are in job group j they are earning more salary and that is why they had gone to the court because they want to understand why there is a discrimination the other question it's about our police officers waziri as you know our officers really do a lot of work what policy are you going to put into place to motivate our police officers because there are those officers who have stayed in one station for over 20 years 
They've, been ne they've never been promoted. They've been never transferred. They are just there in that station. So we need to motivate them. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Mishi, Honorable Mishi. Thank you, Honorable Chairman. Honorable Chairman, I want to ask Professor one question. Professor, as the women of this country, we are shocked and we are sick to see the rising number of femicide cases. In fact, we are really shocked when we saw the bodies which were discovered at the quarry because all the bodies were for ladies or other women. I don't know what is the root cause of this, what contributes all this, who slept on the job. We need to know some answers on these issues. Second, Honorable Chairman, I know he has answered issues on the issue of officers using excessive force during protest. But I also wanted to hear from him, what future plans do you have to ensure that future protests are going to be managed in a way that there'll be no loss of lives? Thank you, Honorable Chairman. Professor? Mr. Speaker, sir. Um, with uh, regard hold, hold, Professor Emaso, you have a point of order? Uh, I think the uh, nominee forgot to respond to mine. Which one? It was on the budget and uh, the issue of recruitment. He did. Think can I respond together? He did. Okay. He did, very clearly. I know I not was misleading you to raise that issue. Mr. Speaker, with regard to the police officers who have been in court about salaries, mainly these were graduate police constables, people or officers who joined at constabular level. During their time, they went to school and studied for a degree. They have been arguing that they need to be taken straight to inspectorate and there has been a long court uh, the battle as long as as soon as that court matter is settled by the apex court will implement whatever decision will come from our judiciary with regard to th uh, that matter going forward we will implement the recommendations of the Maraga Task Force, which creates two tire police service where you can serve in the lower ranks and the academic requirements are different. You serve from constable to senior sergeant or you enter the police service at inspectorate level if you are a graduate as a cadet so that we professionalize a little more the police service and also expedite leadership generation by through cadets who can assume uh, responsibility as OCSs and, and, and commanders at county level and so forth and so forth to avoid a situation where you have officers seeking to extend their time in office at senior levels simply because of a lack of generation of uh, uh, younger commanders. With regard to the motivation, we will, we are working with the National Police Service Commission and if I am approved, I will proceed with this discussion to provide a clearer policy on promotions, transfers, and uh, some form of reward system which will help motivate our officers uh, at the moment. Uh, before I left office, we were implementing the three-year transfer policy. I think we were at 45% uh, compliance because of the logistical and the financial implications. We, if I am reappointed, uh, re if I am approved by this house, I will complete, will have a, a fast-track promotion um, uh, uh, arrangement for officers who do very well. For example, if you are county police commander, you help in uh, reducing crime, you help in fighting femicide, you help in fighting uh, other, other you, you have certain targets which you meet, you should be promoted faster than somebody else who is in the same level, but they are, they are, they are, they are 
performance indicators are in the negative. Finally, I've been asked two questions by the Honorable Mission Boko. The first one is on femicide. It is true, the cases of femicide we are seeing are worrying for the country, and it's, it's also true we have critical gaps, especially at the lower levels of our policing and security apparatus, both the National Intelligence Service, the National Police Service, and also NGAO. And th those are things that uh, we need to work on uh, to avoid situations like what we are seeing. Uh, the incident that happened in Kware is quite devastating, quite, quite um, uh, a grave breach of, of, of the security of our women. And, and it's something that I'm taking with all seriousness. Finally, what plans will I have if I am approved by this house to ensure that uh, we do not have loss of life when citizens exercise their right under Article 37. I will be finalizing for publication the guidelines under the Public Order Act, the one I explained earlier, not to take away the light, but to facilitate, to create an environment where it can be enjoyed, to create responsibility on those who are having protests. Because if you say you have a protest to Parliament, for example, and the designated area for protests can only accommodate a thousand protesters. You cannot say, I want two million protesters outside parliament, because it's not feasible. So we'll have to give those guidelines uh, so that as Kenyans can enjoy these rights while respecting the rights of others uh, in, in accordance with the constitution, I submit. Sharia. Thank you. Um, Chairman, CS nominee in the Court of Public Opinion and in some independent surveys done in this country, the Ministry of Interior and National Administration has been identified as the one with the highest prevalence of corruption in this country. How do you intend to address this menace if approved? Let's take uh, Honorable Ras also. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. Uh, professor, when a Kenyan reads a, a Gazette notice of Kenya Gazette, they will tend to believe that is the true reflection of a policy direction from government. In March uh, this year, uh, you closed the Ilo gold mine uh, in Moyale that it will be closed for 30 days following the skirmishes that had taken place. Uh, but since then, over 30 lives have been lost, including that of uh, security officers. That particular area has turned out to be a black market for mineral entrepreneurs and the citizenry have generally lost faith uh, in government and also in the security agency. Uh, my question to you, uh, if the House approves your nomination, what is it that you are likely to do to reaffirm the community's faith in that the government does what it says it will do, and also uh, that the security of that area, because Dabel has the inhabitants uh, community, that the security is restored. Secondly, Honorable Speaker, uh, those of us who come from the border areas, we have very porous borders. There's influx of arms, contraband, uh, drugs, uh, and also illegal immigrants. Uh, but what we are experiencing also is so many roadblocks and checkpoints. Some actually are rent seekers as opposed to for purposes of security. Uh, Professor, if 
uh, the House approves your nomination, what is it that you are likely to do to ensure there is security for Kenya, but also the communities that are traversing or traveling on those roads are not, uh, to an extent, inhumanly disadvantaged? Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Thank you, Professor. Mr. Speaker, with regard to the question by the Honorable Shurie, it is true corruption is a big cancer in the National Police Service, in the public sector of our country, the two levels of government and the three arms of government. In our assessment of national security threats that are extensive in nature. I have said earlier we have identified five extensive threats to our country's future. Terrorism and violent extremism is one of them. Banditry and other organized crimes is the second. The third one is the problem of narcotic drugs, psychotropic substances, and all that goes with that. The fourth one is climate change and how it is creating uh, disruption of livelihoods and breeding conflicts among communities. The fifth one is corruption. And therefore, going forward, if I'm reappointed, I am going to escalate programs, policies, and measures to eradicate corruption within the organs of the national security that are within the Ministry of Interior, but also propose for the rest of the country, the rest of the uh, government and public sector, measures that can help us secure the country, because it's no longer an issue of the corruption by the police. It's an issue of corruption uh, being able to actually threaten the country's future. And therefore, corruption is top five of our national security threat. Lastly, I've been asked about uh, by the Honorable Dido Rasso about Hilo. It is true. Hilo gold mine in uh, Dabel, Moyale, uh, we closed in March uh, for 30 days, but we've, been, we've extended those orders. We have uh, described, identified that area as a disturbed area because uh, we lost some people there uh, who were fighting over mineral rights, mainly illegal miners who had come even some of them from other countries. So we closed it on security considerations. We are in talks with the Ministry of Mining to see how an orderly resumption of mining activities can happen. I was there physically in June. I was planning to go back in July before this happened. In the interim, we have lost a few people uh, because of illegal activities uh, around there, even as we speak, on a very low scale though. We even lost two police officers in the last two weeks. So as soon as I, if I am approved, as soon as I'm in office, I will prioritize the Dabel issue to ensure orderly resumption of lawful mining activities to the benefit of the communities that are there. With regard to borders, the multi-agency roadblocks we have, especially the one in Archer's Post, the one in, um, in Mombasa, the Garseni Malindi Highway, the, all the multi-agency roadblocks are working well, including the Kanyonyo one the one on uh, uh, Garissa Mwingi, uh, Nairobi Highway. What the criminals have done, those who smuggle arms and aliens and drugs, they are using alternative routes. What am I going to do? The same multi-agency approach that we have used on the main highways will increase our surveillance and put multi-agency effort, not necessarily roadblocks, but patrol teams by our special forces on the alternative routes that drug traffickers, human traffickers, and other criminals are using to harm our country. I submit. Honorable Mule. 
Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much, nominee. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I want to ask uh, Professor that he came to, uh, to be the Minister for Interior after the last election and be vetted by this committee and approved and understanding very clearly the economic policy of the Kenya Kwanza policy of bottom-up uh, economic transformation. You have been in office and uh, I want to bring you to your attention that the National Assembly put up regulations for private security firms uh, to be regulated properly. And in the view of the better or the bottom up, it was to create employment. But in the time you have been in the office, this industry has suffered tremendous losses whereby you have not given them any regulations. You have not restored order and a system in the private uh, sector. And I would wish to know exactly what are you going to do? These private companies have been providing employment to more than almost 1.5 million Kenyans, and they could do better if the government enables proper regulations to create that. And you revoked the license of uh, the private security regulatory authority, whereby uh, nine companies plus in this country have not been able to create employment. Are you in the tandem of the idea of creating employment or making sure that there is no more employment and reducing the tax collection for the government? Because that is in your docket whereby you need to create environment. Uh, and being the last person, Mr. Speaker, I would wish to ask the, the CS uh, to give us a number of activities here. Uh, participated in pro bono work in this country uh, uh, preview to being a CS or after being uh, nominated as a CS in this country and last but not least uh, me, uh, uh, CS the, the issue question. the issue I'm the last one so I just want to give him 10 <laughs> minutes to respond to me uh, uh, the nominee uh, the issue of ID in this country is really, really alarming, especially to the young people who are intending to join institutions of higher learning. And I can assure you quite a number of them, they are not able to register or for admission in the Institute of Higher Learning. What can you do better to make sure that every young people, and especially the Gen Zs, immediately they are clearing their secondary school, they acquire their IDs at the, at, 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 at the tail end of their Form 4. Why do we have to wait for them to get out to the field and start struggling to get this opportunity? What collaboration will you do with the Ministry of Education by the time these young people leave school? they already have an ID. We don't need to wait until they get out here to start struggling. What measures are you going to put if, and I'm using the word if carefully, you'll be approved by parliament and this committee? Professor. Mr. Speaker, sir. The private security uh, regulations emanated from our ministry of course, were presented to National Assembly for approval. So those regulations themselves speak to the fact that we've been actively involved in generating policy guidance and framework uh, for this very critical sector. In fact, it is my belief, having uh, interacted now with the ministry for 21 months, that the private security, if a little bit regulated in terms of uh, the curriculum and the kind of content the, the, the those that uh, are recruited there go through can help us in providing security for some of the private and not so critical installations. And we can vet 
some of the deserving cases to even be armed so that instead of having a police officer manning a supermarket or a, even a bank, sometimes like it, has, it, it happens in Uganda and other countries, you can have very qualified private security people vetted and armed to, put, to supplement the work of the police so that we don't uh, overstretch uh, the national police officers. Um, on the second issue from the Honorable Mule, it is true that the Private Security Regulatory Authority had revoked nine licenses. The nine companies appealed to the Cabinet Secretary, and I reversed that revocation in accordance with Section 43 of the Act. So those licenses that were revoked, they were reinstated on appeal. Fla uh, then the issue of um, pro bono work. Pro bono work, I understand it to mean unpaid work. That's the understanding of pro bono work from my very limited uh, legal uh, background. I, I don't know <laughs> like which one now, maybe in church or at home or where. Because since I became minister, I have no free time to do anything. I have no time to do anything. I hardly sleep. I hardly have a weekend. Night and day are the same for me. But before then, I, I used to volunteer in many, many activities, some organized by Law Society of Kenya, some organized by church organizations, etc., etc. Um, the last question by the Honorable Mule is on identity cards. We have suffered the current discomfort because of court injunctions. That's number one. Court injunctions for four months between last year and early this year, and right now there's even another court injunction. Number two, we have suffered the disruption because of change in technology from the second generation ID to the third generation ID. And I have explained the need for us to change the, the technology because the current ID we have, the second generation ID, cannot be recognized outside this country. It cannot even be a travel document. The security features are completely, are very rudimentary, very basic. And therefore, the move to new technology, better technology, more secure document has caused disruption. Court injunctions have also caused destruction. And just like passports, in the event that I am reappointed, because uh, the member said he used if deliberately, of course, I also want to promise if I am reappointed, the same way I have focused on reforming the immigration um, directorate and helping unclog the passport inefficiency problem. I will focus on IDs and also birth and other citizen uh, uh, documents to ensure that we get optimum results. In fact, for example, a death or birth certificate should be obtained the same day within 12 hours on application. And perhaps the, the ID, we should be able again to read to. Once we get out of the court injunction, we should be able to retain the seven day um, a target. At the moment, we are working with 21 days before the injunction. Thank you, Minister, uh, nominee, sorry. Naisula, I didn't want to go Speaker, for another round. No. Speaker, I will not, after this nominee, I'll never ask for another round, and it's not a question, it's just a comment, because I'm very passionate about the issues on North Rift, and if the nominee happens to be approved by this committee and the National Assembly, I would like to just say that even as you deal with security matters and the hardware, Please remember also peace and dialogue of those communities. Now that there seems to be some semblance of calm, this is the best opportunity to now engage those communities to deal with the stereotypes and also for them 
to be able to remove the criminals among the communities. Please, in case this committee passes you, uh, um, approves you, ensure that you have a budget that will help you to engage the communities so that we can deal this issue once and for all. For Shakahola and Kware and all the other issues, we want to see action and not just talk. Yes. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, for the supplementary one. In conclusion, CS nominee, your appointing authority has considered to the country that one of the failings that uh, the president considered to was lack of communication. You have told us here of very good measures that you have taken in the State Department for immigration, especially in the processing of passports and all that. However, that information is never uh, in the purview of the public, members of the public. And indeed, I have an incident, uh, CS, where a Kenyan in the US called me very desperate that they could not get their uh, passport despite having paid somebody about 20,000 shillings. For a passport, was, I think the normal charges are about 4,000 or 3,000 something. And uh, when I followed up the case, the person who was even uh, paid this bribe was not uh, an officer of the immigration department and he took the intervention of the uh, director general immigration uh, miss evelyn to get the dci to hunt for that person somebody extorting kenyans money from eastlands pretending to be working in your house and therefore the lack of communication aspect in your ministry is what i want you to address should you uh, or if you are approved what are you going to do to ensure that there is proper communication to the public so that the public are not taken uh, advantage of by uh, criminals out there in eastlands and elsewhere who are extorting bribes from kenyans on the pretext that they are working in Nyayo House. And uh, just like Owen Bayer said, you once declared Nyayo House a crime scene. Uh, that crime scene now seems to have moved from Nyayo House to the periphery of Nyayo House and other areas. I would want to hear what specific measures you intend to uh, take to make sure there is proper communication. Kenyans know how much they ought to pay and to who. And uh, so that they are not taken advantage of because uh, you are also aware that has been very rampant. Chairman, thank you. Chairman, I just wanted to ask the CS, this issue of the IDs. Uh, 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 professor, you say the IDs will expire after 10 years. Have you put into consideration the first areas, people like uh, in North Turkana, uh, how far they travel to get IDs? Because IDs are not like passport, they're essential documents that people must have all the time. After, you know, the kind of, it will be cumbersome for them to go to those centers to go and get IDs. And secondly, on this unrest, you have seen that, as you said, as you have said, the ID uh, uh, resigned. But are you aware in your absence while you are away? We used to have Baba while you are away, but while you are away, that a new IG was, was, was appointed. He's was, still away, he can't answer. Uh, well, uh, no, no, but that, uh, what is your take? That uh, we <laughs> were told away. 60 years, Mr. Speaker, I'm putting it in a better way. Yes. We were told when somebody reaches 60 years, he should leave the public service. Are you aware that a new IG has been nominated who's 64 years or 63 years, who has, who has retired, who is being recycled? I don't know what extra thing is going to bring. And my last question is uh, on illicit Bruce. The Interior Ministry has been accused by the Deputy President of sabotaging the war on illicit Bruce. Is the war on illicit Bruce only being waged in Mount Kenya? What aspects of this war are being undertaken in the Interior Ministry? And what is being done by the Office of the Deputy President? How much funds have been used in this war in the last two years when you were the Interior Ministry, before you were fired? Uh, nominee, on the issue of the IG, I direct you not to answer the question, because I've received communication from the President nominating the nominee, who will be vetted by a committee of Parliament, and those questions can be raised there. If you answer that here, you'll be prejudicing what is coming to Parliament. Answer the other questions. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Nasula was a comment. We have taken it on board. Honorable Kimani Chung was 
issue was about communication. When I assumed office in uh, October 2022, I began a, a habit of every three, four months updating the country on the status of our homeland security. We've not had one in a while. I had planned one for June, which was postponed and thereafter disrupted. We will use our public accountability updates on security matters to communicate more on what we are doing. And the next, uh, if I am approved by this house, the next public accountability address will feature more on the reforms we have made at immigration. Uh, department, uh, because I think there, there we've made a lot of success. Uh, people concentrate on the banditry thing, but I think also on the passport issue we've made a lot of success. Where we still have problems is the IDs and, and other aspects of citizenship documents. With regard to the ID, the question by the, the Honorable Junet Mohammed, um, the reason for the 10-year limit, there are two reasons. It's actually one reason. It's because of changes in technology. Unlike the ID we have, which, which has no security features, and therefore it can be timeless. But uh, we'll find a way of making it convenient to the people of Kenya to renew after the 10 years, so that you, again, you don't create a crisis uh, for, uh, by people. Uh, uh, and, and we can do that by even having a phased out uh, renewal process to ensure that again we don't in, uh, inconvenience masses of people. So the problem is technology and the security features in the third generation ID, which is going to be physical, that is the Maisha card. It is going to be also digital, the digital ID. You can have it digitally. So all those are options for the third generation ID, quite sophisticated in tandem with the current trends in um, security on identity documents. With regard to the issue raised on Bruce, I would uh, be hesitant to respond to the comment associated with the Deputy President for obvious reasons. Uh, but I think to the best of my knowledge, the Minister of Interior was not cited as frustrating the war. Uh, if there are specific officers in the ministry, I think that is something that needs to be looked into to make sure that all of us are reading from the same script. The government policy is to make sure that illicit brews, toxic substances and drugs are not um, uh, uh, provided to our kids, not just in central Kenya, but everywhere in the country. With regard to how much money the Deputy President Office has used, again, I am not privy, and I think that is the office that can answer that question. How much funds have we used in the fight against Peru? We have not allocated any special budget in the Ministry of Interior in the fight against alcoholic, uh, illicit alcoholic drinks and drugs. We have used our normal budgets, our normal security operations budget to carry out uh, that program as part of the normal programs. I submit. Professor, I'll ask you one or two questions. The first one is a furtherance on the issue of IDs. As you introduce a 10-year ID, just take into account that an ID in this country is everything. You can't enter a supermarket, you can't open a bank account, the, the old and PWDs cannot access social safety net funds without an ID. Now, if you are going to have that ID last for 10 years, then you must put in place a seamless renewal process so that people don't suffer because of failure to renew an ID card. And you, as if you are approved to go back to office, I would want to see that you draft regulations that will guide and manage renewal of IDs and bring to Parliament for approval. The second issue 
I want to ask you, nobody asked you, prisons fall under your authority if you are approved. What are you doing or what do you propose to do about prison reforms? I remember when we were senators and we went with you to Kitui and we found prisoners literally half naked, poorly dressed and looking like they were very poor hygienic conditions in which they were operating. What are you going to do if approved in prison reforms to make prisons more humane? And also, what are you going to do to reverse the continuing stealing and grabbing of public land occupied by prisons in the country, which is going on all over? Thirdly, the new constitution allows Kenyans who had left the country, taken greener pastures and acquired citizenships of other countries to reacquire Kenyan citizenship on application. That's what the constitution says. But we get a lot of communication and phone calls from Kenyans out there who are struggling to reclaim their citizenship because they have either British or American or whatever citizenship. What are you doing to simplify? Because the constitution says you reclaim your citizenship on application. What are you going to do to simplify the process of reclaiming citizenship by Kenyans who lost their citizenship? If you can answer those, then I'll come to other simpler questions to you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker, on the first issue of uh, IDs, I agree with your recommendation and guidance that we should consider seamless transition from, from the, after the 10 years to avoid uh, creating a crisis. I believe it will be possible because we had a similar situation with passports when we went into e-passports. So what you do, for example, is to say that the ID that has expired will continue operating until you get a new one, mm -hmm. for example, because you cannot be faulted because of a government administrative measure. Number two, we will make sure that we anticipate and put in place a rapid response initiative where you deploy additional facilities, additional service points, additional personnel, even if it's on a temporary basis, at a time when many of these IDs will be expiring. But by and large, the old ID, the expired ID should work until when the state gives you uh, a new one. Uh, because it's simply for technology purposes, safety p features. It is not that we will give again another ID. Uh, it might even be the same, depending on whether or not we will consider that ID as being uh, secure, um, a secure document by that time. With regard to regulations as guided, we will prioritize that, Mr. Speaker. With regard to Kenya prisons, we have um, part of the Maraga Task Force ref uh, report. We have a number of recommendations on modernizing and reforming the prisons, which we are taking up. I have prepared a CAP memo, uh, which had not uh, been submitted to cabinet, but I'm sure uh, if I'm reappointed, that will be a priority. And the areas of reform include making the prison enterprises more productive by investing in better technology in their workshops to make sure they produce more competitive goods which are affordable. Number two, welfare issues. In fact, these seats you see here were made by prisons. Absolutely. So if they are empowered, because that is labor and skill is available, if they are given better equipment and uh, for carpentry, for masonry and other skills in the prisons, we are going to have better output and, and, and generate more revenue and avoid the prisons um, relying on s check all the time in these times of constrained budget. We also want to make sure 
that we improve on welfare issues, including the terms and conditions of service of prison wardens, is part of the Maraga Task Force recommendation in consultation with the SRC. We also are working on soft software issues, for example, providing mattresses. Uh, we have a program called One Prisoner, One Mattress uh, program, uh, where up to now we have provided 10,000 uh, from our budget, but also in, in, um, with the support of other partners. And we want to make sure that every prisoner at least has a, a mattress as we even work on physical facilities and the housing for our prison warders, we want to construct 28,000. And we have already, I think, I don't have the figures right now, but I think we've done nearly 500 in different prison facilities. We want to do 28,000, which should meet almost meet the entire demand because that is almost the the population of our prison um, uh, uh, personnel uh, complement other than that the prison land there are certain um, serious uh, encroachments on uh, on on prison land uh, the most notorious one is the kitale prison land where out of the 3,000 uh, acres, uh, only less than 300 are available. The rest have been grabbed by powerful and former senior people in various administrations and their friends. We will have to recover it. We have engaged the National Land Commission and other stakeholders. We will recover the land. They say that every prison land must have a title deed. Many of our prison lands are not titled, so we are working there, protected through titling. The last question, Mr. Speaker, sir, you asked is about uh, those Kenyans who are regaining citizenship. We have made tremendous progress, and I want to admit in line with what the leader of majority said. I think the communication is what we need to improve on. We have made tremendous improvement and reforms in the processing of citizenship applications by foreign nationals who want to be Kenyans, but also by Kenyans who had lost their nationality uh, before the 2010 constitution and are now entitled to reapply. When I came to office, there were 2,700 pending applications. I cleared the backlog within 30 days. Uh, right now, we are receiving applications on a rolling basis. I have directed, uh, I had directed the directorate to ensure that from the time of application to the time the minister signs off uh, that application for regaining citizenship, it should not be more than 21 days. And uh, I think that is work in progress. Lastly, how do we simplify? We will reduce the paperwork. There is a bit of paperwork in that directorate, yes. um, and we want to reduce it and go uh, digital and make sure that we even bring the timelines from 21 days to seven days to possibly uh, three days uh, on application. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Lastly, nominee, do you hold any leadership position in any political party? No. Have you ever been adversely mentioned in any integrity-related reports? No. On investigations? Do you hold citizenship of any other country? No. What is your worth? 694 million. Made of? Made of uh, my, I have two homes, one in Nairobi and one in Tarakanidhi. Um, then uh, I have uh, larger buildings, about 235 million. My two homes are worth uh, 190 million. And then uh, I also have uh, 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 savings in circles and banks. I also do uh, legal practice. Uh, so I have a bit of revenue that I've generated through my law firm. And, uh, and that is that is it. And I forgot, uh, Mr. Speaker, when I was filling in, I forgot um, to add. I have vehicles of about uh, 17 million, which are not part of that report. I apologise. I remembered after I had submitted the the questionnaire. 
Honorable members, we received a memoranda from one Elliot Karanja Matindi, Isaac Alwacher, Joseph Mwathi Nyangjui, Khalid Ibrahim, Aisha Adan, Sonia Mushila, Masi Murugi Kuria, Ahmed Sigat, Okio Mtato Koit, David Malombe, and Colin Sonyango. We forwarded them to the nominee, and the nominee responded to all of them in writing. We have them on record. Professor, we allocated one hour, two hours. We've done with you two hours and 10 minutes. Uh, we want to inform you that this brings to an end our interaction with you. The clerk has checked all your documents against what you submitted have been found to be correct and in order.